actually one of the first things we did after I was elected, myself and Mr. Worski, who's my first assistant, we met with Barry Sheck. And uh, if any of you knows, he is a leader. And uh, when it comes to these types, conviction integrity, um, he is the leader in the nation. And uh, we are communicating with him to make sure we get the very best person to lead that unit. And so we're not just, we just haven't, we have not filled it because we want to make sure that we get someone who is a thought leader, someone who's forward thinking, and to make sure that we can open up and start looking, if appropriate, cases that are not, that are non DNA. Because the DNA cases were easy cases because it's conclusive testing. It's those issues where there's ID, identification is an issue. I mean, there's all types of issues that we're talking about. And these are things that we want to make sure that we get the most progressive and experienced prosecutor that could come in and lead that unit. So I can assure you that, that that we are going to do that and continue that as well. Before he comes, if the DPD is not filing criminal charges on a criminal matter, how do you get your case heard by the DPD? That, that's a good, good question. Um, and I think that that's something that we need to address how we handle that. And there used to be something that was called grand jury referrals, and that's something we're working on to see how we can change. So um, I can't give you an answer or a phone number exactly right now to call, but I can tell you that that's one of the things that I will address and ensure that the community is aware of how they can file a case or talk to an investigator at the, at the district attorney's office if they feel like they are not being heard by the police department. Because I think that is imperative, especially when we talk about domestic violence cases. Because sometimes, a lot of times, individuals are afraid to call 911. But, so they stay in a situation that is, that is dangerous. So we want to, actually we are starting now a hotline that's called DASH, and it's going to be the DA hotline, and um, I'll give you that number before we left. Before we leave today, make sure you have that. For those at the mic, we want to ask you to please keep your question, one question, and please keep it brief so we can work through the line. Yes, sir. My name is Michelle McMurray. I have one question. I'm sorry. Hi. How many African-American lawyers did you retain from the Watkins administration? Did I keep? Yes. I kept all of them except out of 255 prosecutors. Yes. I kept, oh well, they resigned actually. Um, Mr. Heath Harris, Mr. Russell Wilson. Um, <coughs> two. I just, give me a moment to think. They actually resigned, Heath Harris and Russell Wilson. David Alex was a trial bureau chief and I kept him. Um, but actually he just resigned to get work at Tarrant County. So, I mean, that was never an issue for me. Okay. That was never an issue for me. Like I said, there are great prosecutors that worked under Mr. Watkins. And you can ask anyone that's here to tell you that that has not been an issue. I've, I let out of 255 prosecutors, there were seven that were invited not to, get, to be sworn in. And Two of them, I believe, and I just want to make sure I'm clear on that, were African American. Okay, thank you. Thank you. One question, please. How do you evaluate prosecutors and judges when they upturn gag orders, witness tampering, and suppression of evidence, which causes, which causes an unfair trial? How do you evaluate prosecutors and judges? Well, you can file bar, you can file complaints with the state bar of Texas, and you can file follow the group since it gets the judge as well. The process that you can do. You go to actually to the texasbar.com, you can figure out how you can learn how you can file agreements. And the judge has certain processes as well where you can file agreements against them. Next question. Good evening. My name is Manuel Valadez. I am on the board of directors for C Web. How many people have heard of that? <laughs> so I'm watch executive board. I'm also on the vice chair of the district attorney's uh, Ambassadors, I have heard yes. of that. I have. Also, um, my question is dealing with the community. First of all, Dallas has a very good program for community service to the people, and a lot of people don't know. The, the officer over there didn't mention the uh, chief on the beat. He didn't mention the Dallas Junior Police Academy. He didn't mention the PBS Sports Scouts. There's a lot of things that Dallas does. For the problem is that when I come to all these meetings, it's always the same people that appear here. And that's one thing. My question is, in talking to the community, uh, they get the feeling that, that it's a revolving door, that, that the police actually catch burglars and thieves and robbers, and, and that those thieves and robbers get out of the jail or get out of 
loose there before they even finish paperwork. That's right. What, what, what do you intend to do about well, something like that? Because you hear that there's not enough jail space. And I think as we reprioritize which types of cases that we're prosecuting and how we're, what are the offers being made in plea bargains, when you have habitual offenders and what you call impact offenders that are constantly in your community committing crimes and tormenting citizens, basically, time and time again, then it's our responsibility to make sure these individuals do not get out quickly and that we prosecute them, we go to trial, we get, they get the sentences they deserve because they're not back out on the streets tormenting citizens. And that's one thing I've seen time and time again, that actually individuals, that they just go back into the community, they, they break into their houses, break into their cars, and because it's a misdemeanor, or it's because the state jail that gets pled down to a misdemeanor, these cases are just a revolving door. And there's no incentive for them to stop because they know that they're going to get an easy plea bargain sometimes. Now, I think that's something that because of jail population, there's different factors that come into play on why we or how we were handling those cases. At, uh, but I just think it's another thing that we just have a shift in the way we think on which type of cases that need to go to trial, which type of cases that should there not be any deals made on plea bargains when you have habitual offenders, violent offenders, and impact offenders. And the individuals that are continually hurting themselves time and time, again, that's why it's our responsibility to know what the diversion programs are and have a, participate in those programs and ensure that these individuals are diverted out. Well, I would encourage you to pursue that because that's what I hear. And I just want to tell you that the district attorney's office is a head law enforcement agency for the county. Okay. Next question. We, as mothers and fathers of victims, become targets of slander, retaliation. All we want is justice for our loved ones. So what advice do you have for a mother or a father that's, that's here this evening? They're, they're, they, have, they have called in the crime, they have, but as they try to fight for it, they also find themselves victims of retaliation in the community because all they want is justice. I understand that. I don't have children, but I can only imagine. And um, I've always said that anyone who loses a child and uh, feel like the district attorney's office is not doing anything about it, they need to call me personally. And I'll do what I can do. Thank you. Let me get one more, and then we'll go to the mic for one more question. Um, for someone that has committed their first offense, instead of sending them to jail for 30 to 60 days of probation, is there a program that can be developed to help first offenders so they don't have to be sent to jail and give them a chance or the right to try and get on the right track before persecution, prosecution? Well, we have a program that's the TOPS program in the first half. And Rachel was actually was head of that program as well, but we didn't have a, we believe that the numbers, we can open up the numbers and have um, many more defendants that can participate. It's called TOPS, we call it First Chance Initiative, but there really was no organization. Um, How did they get into TOPS? How did they well, fight? that's what we're working on, because there was no criteria in place, and there was no, uh, it was not very organized until now. And we're getting it organized. And so, give me a month. We're just about out of time. I promise so you we'll get that, get, roll that initiative out and make sure that we're addressing that. Perfect. We have just a few, just a few more moments left, so we'll take uh, we have five people standing. We need a real quick question so she can give you a quick answer. As we James Reed, I'm with the Dallas Beach City Foundation. Hello. Our question real quickly is, sure. are you going to be able to provide more money so that therefore we can be able to get better representation for public defenders so that those who are indigent can be able to better, have a better chance of being able to uh, get, a, get a good uh, 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 defense in the courtroom. Well, that, that's not the district attorney's office responsible. That's something you need to talk to your commissioners about, your elected commissioners, and, and they can address that. They're the ones that budget for the public defender's office. And they handle the, the, the county's budget as well. So I, hope, I, I wish I could do something to help you, but I can't. That's something that, that has to be addressed with your commissioners. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Tammy Simpson. Simpson, I'm here on behalf of the Troy E. Causey Jr. Foundation for Change. Troy Causey was my son that was murdered last year, the basketball player for Wilson Hutchins High School, murdered by the, um, the alleged, it's actually used legal terms here, alleged suspect, um, Jonathan Turner. My question is, my concern is, I've tried several times to reach the last DA to discuss our blatant um, first degree murder. Um, case could be reduced, how could a blatant first degree murder case could be reduced to a manslaughter case with only one person indicted 
Um, with the overwhelming evidence, like tampering with evidence, perjury, law parties, and mandatory reporter violations, and obviously a dead body with a crushed skull, how could that possibly mean manslaughter? Clearly, evidence was withheld from the grand jury, but um, this district, the last district attorney consistently shunned me. He shunned me in public. Um, he never returned my phone calls, and, um, and uh, he refused to meet with me. So far, since you've taken um, the office, and I did vote for you because I did like the platform reform that you ran on, you want your attorneys, to, your district attorneys, to try the tougher cases, not just speed them out. That is what sold me, so therefore I voted for you. Since you've taken office, um, you have neither returned my phone call nor um, agreed to meet with me and get me on your calendar. I've spoken with your assistant. I've spoken with several people in your office. I've been there in person several times. And um, um, so now uh, I just want to... And I, and I said that we, when you schedule an appointment, mm -hmm. which we, which I know that since my, my assistant talked to you about that, then we, I promise you I will discuss the case with you. I, I've been up there to discuss, to get an appointment, and no one... We'll get a, I promise you, I will make sure that you have an appointment with me here. And if, I'm sorry if that's happened, because I, like I said before, I believe that if anyone has lost a child, that I will make sure that I meet with them, because I can't even imagine it. And I promise you that you will be hurt. Thank you. Thank you. And everyone heard it? That's my pledge to anyone. If someone's lost a child, and you feel like justice has not been served, I will meet with you and talk to you. I'm Cora Candy, I'm with No More Violence and Keep On Bowling with my son. Uh, I don't know what happened to him. Uh, the Dallas Police Department did, did not come to my house and tell me. <coughs> when it got into the hands of the DA's office, it was the grand jury was over. I knew nothing about uh, the grand jury's decision. Uh, and D.A. Hawk, um, I just want to ask a question about these cases that are unsolved because my son's case truly is an unsolved case. It was a cold case and it says it in the, in the Dallas Morning News. Um, I'm here standing for a lot of moms that are not satisfied with the justice system and the decision of the outcome of these cases. My son uh, was in the hands of the Dallas Police Department. And I was not able to see my son. I was not able to identify my son. No mother or father should go through that. And um, my uh, uh, deal now is victims with a purpose. We become victims when we fight for our children. We become the victims and the perpetrators get away. So I just want to ask you a question, daughter. What are you going to do about these cases that are solved? Well, then we need to look into it. And, uh, you know, I can't make you any promises of what the outcome will be. But this is why I'm here talking to you tonight. Because I wouldn't know about that if I didn't have a town hall meeting. I, I, wouldn't know, I wouldn't get to hear your story. And that's why this is so important to me. Because when you called. tell me your story, I have then we can, we, that, that's how we fix these things. Or we'll, maybe we don't come up with a solution, mm -hmm. but we do our very best to. Well, and I have called, and like I said, I'm working with several moms, and okay. uh, if, you are, if you would talk to us. I will, I'm happy to talk to you. All right, darling. 